Prime Probe 1 JavaScript 0, Overcoming Browser-Based Side Channel Defenses. I'm Anatoly Schusterman, and this is a joint work with Ayush, Sioli, Daniel, Yossi, and Yuval. When you talk of cybersecurity, you often talk about malware that exploit vulnerabilities or bugs in a software. And from the other side, there are countermeasures that prevent unwanted interaction between processes like virtual memory and user kernel separation. Another type of attacks are microarchitectural attacks, which sneaks below the trust boundaries because the vulnerabilities allowing them exist in the hardware. One of these attacks is Prime and Probe. In Prime and Probe, the attacker exploits the shared CPU cache to identify patterns of victim process in the same machine. The attacker allocates cache size buffer, probe it periodically, and measure the access time. When the victim process has its own temporal and spatial patterns, it evicts the attacker's cache sets. Now the attacker can identify victim patterns when measuring a longer probe time. For prime probe attack, we need array buffer memory mapping and a nanosecond timer to have special resolution. And we get cover channels and private key retrieval with permissionless script. So why don't we do this from the web? Oh, it has already been done on 2014. Since then, browser vendors restricted the direct memory access and reduced the timer resolution to milliseconds. Here we start our research and ask, what are the minimal requirements for executing microarchitectural side channel attacks? Another question about the various microprocessors. The current attacks are tailored to each processor separately. Can processor diversity prevent side channel attacks? In this paper, we deliver end-to-end -end remote cache attack with no timers, no arrays, and finally, no JavaScript. This attack is architecturally agnostic, which works on several processors. Among them, we executed the first attack on Apple M1. So we have no direct memory access and a reduced timer resolution. Let's start. First attack is cache occupancy. This method was introduced in Usenix 19. In regular prime and probe, the attacker measured cache contention in each cache set separately. N now, when we don't have nanosecond timer resolution, we measure the cache contention over the whole last level cache. Using this method, we reduce the needed timer resolution to milliseconds, but then we lose the spatial resolution. Also, for execution of this attack, no CPU reverse engineering is needed. So, why don't use super low clock resolution? Will it defend us? When attacking browsers like Tor with super low timer resolution, we can use another method described in the same paper, sweeps counting. Instead of measuring the cache contention over time, we count how many times we can probe the last level cache in a clock tick of 100 milliseconds. When the, time, when the probe time is lower, the cache contention is higher and vice versa. The required timer resolution needed here is only 10 Hertz. So let's disable timers at all. We don't need them anyway. Let's remember the prime probe ingredients. First is allocation and probing of cache sized array buffer, and second is a timer. This is our new attack, DNS racing. For this attack, we need a web page on the target machine and a DNS server. First of all, the attacker web page resolves non existing domain. Then the attacker counts how many times it can probe the cache until it gets a non existing domain exception. So we have timer and we probe the cache, so we have cache attack with no timers required and it resists jitter well enough to be 
used between two continents. So previously we disabled timers. Now let's disable the array API too. Our next attack is string and sock. Here we use setting, uh, here we use strings instead of arrays. For this attack, we need a web page on the victim's machine and a colluding WebSocket server. First of all, we send a short packet to the server and it logs the time. But then we need a method to mount a whole large string in the last level cache. So we search non-existing character in a long, long string. The CPU can't do any optimization here and it is forced to probe the whole last level cache. Then the attacker send short bucket again to log the end time. So we probe the last level cache. We have a timer on the remote server. So we have cache contention attack and no timers and no arrays required in the JavaScript. Okay, let's go bigger. Let's disable JavaScript. There are already now applications like NoScript that disable the JavaScript in the web page. We can manage with HTML and CSS with beautiful fonts and background pictures. That would be great. Okay, this is our last attack. No JavaScript, only CSS. For this attack, we need a web page on the victim's machine and a colluding DNS server. First of all, we resolve non-existing domain to log the start time. Then we search in a long string to probe the cache. And finally, we resolve non-existing domain to log the end time. So how can we do this from CSS? Let's see. In the HTML file, we have div with a very long class name. Then in the CSS file, we search non-existing strings in this class name. And when it fails, we get non-existing background image from the web and log the time in the server. So we prop the cache and we have a timer. We can execute cache contention attack. Great. But it's very inaccurate and it's probably useless for cryptography. So what is it good for? It is good for privacy attacks like website fingerprinting. In website fingerprinting attack, the adversary uses leakage that disclose which website the victim saw. This attack might reveal human secrets like sexual orientation, health conditions, or even political views. In some cases, an access to this type of information has a very big impact. So what we did was measuring the cache contention traces while rendering web pages. Different objects and scripts produce different contention on the last level cache and thus produce distinct fingerprint over time. We collected 100 traces for each of 100 URLs for each attack for each different processor architectures. Then we trained deep learning models to classify the cache contention traces to its related URL. Because we have 100 websites with the same amount of measurements for each, a random guess accuracy will be 1%, and any percent above this will be considered as a leakage. We can see that using our attacks, we succeeded much more uh, than the random guess. And most of the attacks has uh, succeeded in all of the uh, microprocessors cases. So finally, in conclusion, we have cache contention attacks that might be mounted through the browser, even in the most restricted environments. Also, we learned that reducing the requirements of the attack make it agnostic over different architectures. And finally, protection against microarchitectural leaks should be applied in the, in the source, not at the receiver. Thank you very much 
for more details and exciting experiments, you can scan the QR code or access the web page. Thank you very much.